So they were used primarily, um, Charles Babbage, you've all heard of Charles Babbage, I think, uh, he, along with John Herschel, their frustration at the inaccuracy of these things, he said, I just wish we could make these work by steam. Because from his point of view, steam would work regardless. Humans, we're, we're fallible. We have too many problems. We, we make mistakes, we're silly, um, and we can't write zeros if we're doing strings of numbers. Um, so he tried to invent a machine called the differential, and, uh, the difference engine, sorry, and the, 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 the other one is the analyze. The analyze engine. Apologies. He couldn't make them for reasons we'll talk about next door again. Um, and a number of people tried from 18, about 1820 to 1931 was when the first one was uh, correctly made. To over 100 years because of the lack of talk, which we can go through, as I say. So there was a guy in 1931, I'm getting to the point, I promise, a little bit of context. Vannevar Bush in America. Um, he, that isn't Vannevar Bush there, no, that's uh, the Manchester machine. Vannevar Bush made one of these machines work because the torque amplifier had been invented a few years before. So essentially, when we go next door, you'll see there are two discs. There's a glass disc, and then there's a metal disc that sits on top of it. It's a very, very fine disc. The glass disc spins, and it moves the metal disc um, in relation to it. But there's such a lack of friction between those that you can't get the torque to drive the rest of the machine. So you have to have something called a torque amplifier, which increases the ability for the parts of the machine to move, because there was just no contact. It would slip and slide, and it was just inherently inaccurate. And it took 100 years until it was invented. Um, We'll give up on Bonita because I realise that's just ringing ringing if anyone could just throw my iPad out the window. Um, <laughs> Press N. Yeah. Thank you, thanks so much. Um, so he built it in 1931. Harch, it worked. Harcher went over, uh, this is Douglas Harcher here, he went over and he said, This is great. It looks like a Meccano set. He literally said that. He said, This looks like a toy. And he went home and working with Arthur Porter, who was his research student, God bless research students, um, <laughs> he made Arthur Porter build it and he worked with him to build it. And they built it from Meccano. Uh, and it was, it, they used it initially, um, Porter used it for his master's thesis to work out um, uh, the atomic wave functions of chromium atoms. I'll explain that next door. Don't worry about it right now. It's very simple when we go through what we're going to go through next door. Um, he used it for that calculation, got his master's thesis, and it was subsequently used for a number of other things. When uh, this led to a larger machine, which is the Manchester machine here, so that's actually Hartree there, if you want to have a look, with his team. This is uh, Phyllis Lockett and, a very, uh, and Jack Howlett and a few others. Um, they built the Manchester machine in 1935 on the, on the basis of the success of this machine, made from a Carno, kind of made, I don't want to say made as a joke, because it wasn't, but it was made from a child's toy just to see if it could work. And they were blown away by how useful this thing was. It was 98% accurate, and we'll discuss accuracy next door, so again, don't worry about that. Uh, it was 98% accurate, which they couldn't believe that this machine made from a child's toy was that good. And I'm going to keep coming back to the fact it was a child's toy. <coughs> they made the Manchester machine, which was more powerful, more accurate. We'll discuss power and accuracy next door. And you can see it's a much bigger machine just from this picture. And Douglas Hutchie's son, Richard, is still alive. He is 90 years old. And I spoke to him last week. And he, I was asking him about this. And he was saying that during the Second World War, despite all the history books saying it was used in the Second World War, He's then actually kept it in his study at home, just sat on a desk the entirety of the war, and people mistake this machine for the Manchester machine and various others. Anyway, uh, this machine, and Matt, I'm saying this for Matt's benefit. I uh, hope so. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So, a lot of people, if I say to you, tell me about the history of computing, people would throw the name Babbage at me probably, the name Turing would probably come up, and then probably lead on to Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and various others, and we all kind of know who those people are. Hartree and Porter, Hartree, Hartree and Bush, I guess, and Porter as well, they've kind of been forgotten, almost in this middle bit. They, 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 the phrase we used earlier is that these guys were standing on the shoulders of Babbage and others. Mm. Turing and others stood on the shoulders of these guys. Mm. We don't really hear about that. So Hartree died in 1952, not long after the war, and he actually coined the phrase digital and analog. That was him. He came up with that idea when talking about computers. No one had said it before. Uh, and, and that was his phrase, and he was fundamental in taking this technology into the digital realm, the digital, digital context of, of those computers. So he was, he was one of the people <coughs> at those conferences in 1945-46, building the digital computers. Um, but he's a kind of unknown, because he kind of died, and people kind of forgot him, and you know, various other things. Any historians, I'm really sorry about the kind of, he was the man of, the man of history. I'm not saying that at all, but for, for the, the context of this, you'll understand why. So this is a very important machine, which is why we've rebuilt it next door. 
So built from Meccano in 1934, used to justify the Manchester machine. In 1947, after the Second World War, Hartree got a job at Cambridge. He was originally in Manchester. He disassembled it. They took it apart. With his frustration, this is the original machine, uh, with the frustration, he rebuilt this, which is what sits in the Science Museum today, looking at Ben. Uh, this is the Hartree differential analyzer in the museum. And can anyone tell me the difference between this and that? <laughs> Look, Ben, just give me some eyebrows. The size. Right, well, the colour. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what is the colour? What is the colour? Yes. There's no flies on Becky. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's the size and the colour. So, this is an integrator. This is part of an integrator from the original machine. And we can, again, show you this next door. So, when Ian, who's now disappeared, worked to rebuild this, he literally sat with this picture in front of him and rebuilt it. Even though it's more awkward to build it the way he's built it, so it looks as much like this as we can to show you the difference. If you read any books about it, and if you're interested, please do, and I can tell you the books to read, you will probably get pictures like this, which are very hard to see what's going on. You'll get pictures like this, which are very hard to see what's going on. Even if you write, I have no idea what's going on there, even though it's actually quite simple when we explain it. And you have this picture. Well, this can't work, because there's no engine on it, there's no input table, there's no output table. This is literally, how do we describe this earlier? That's the axle of a car. That's like saying that's a car. <coughs> If that's the car, if you like. Does that make sense? Taking a part of the car. There's no steering wheel, there's no driving yeah. wheels. So that's, it's not quite the engine, but it's no, it's, the, but it's, it's part of the gearbox. Yes. It's well, I mean, yeah, it's a gear. So the probably. engine to, to the wheels. Yes. So the point of all of this um, is when it was presented in the magazine, um, we have this outside as well, it was presented this amazing machine, the mechanical marvel. Change, change, you know, uh, this is the Meccano magazine specifically. Changed. Kind of uh, all aspects of computing, the Vannevar Bush machine and, and, and the Meccano machine. Interestingly, the magazine focuses much more on how good the Meccano aspect of it is. So they spent the entire article saying, well, I mean, Meccano is the reason this thing was built, kind of forgetting that Bush had done it a couple of years before without Meccano. Um, and you have this fantastic moment in here where uh, we've spoken about it recently. Meccano go on about how amazing it was. But the truth is, actually, the fact it was made from Meccano was a negative. It caused the machine to buckle and break and various other bits and bobs. But you'd never be told that, because Meccano is a boy's toy and an engineer's tool. And they fed on the fact, they fed on the fact that Hartree had used it as a boy. And they said things like, due to his use of Meccano as a boy, naturally, he built the differential analyzer from Meccano. <laughs> Does that seem like a natural thing that you'd go, I'm going to use this toy? Yes. <laughs> Everyone else, does it seem like a natural idea? We both did. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll go to the story. So Matt and Ian both built one of these when they were 16 and 17. Um, mind blowing. Um, how, how amazing that is. So, Meccano really, they, they kind of really uh, capitalised on the fact that this had been built from Meccano and they capitalised on Hartree and who he was to sell this idea that Meccano was an engineer's tool, uh, an, a tool of engineers. Um, lots happened to the Meccano magazine and the brand after that. They didn't keep up with the times. Lego was invented in 49, became popular around, I think, 61, 62 was when it, when it came in. Uh, in the 50s, the UK government relaxed all of the um, import laws, so you suddenly had this mass explosion of plastic toys. So Meccano said, Meccano said, we need to keep up with this. Our toys are metal, they're more expensive. Oh, unfortunately, it's not in here. There's a, hopefully a great poster of a boy, I think, out there with plastic Meccano in 1964. Go and find it. He's the saddest looking boy that was ever made in a set of toys. And he's, like, he's literally there like, oh, the most boring toy because it's plastic. And if I say plastic Meccano, I know you are, you're on the fence about plastic Meccano, but the response of other people in your place. Place. It's got a place. <coughs> plastic Meccano is akin to Lego, to some members of the Meccano Guild. Guild, uh, the Meccano Club, sorry. Um, Guild. Guild. We'll talk about this. We'll, we'll talk about this, but I, I, I feel like I'm touching on too many things without going into enough detail, so I apologise, but hopefully it still leads to questions. And at this point, I'm going to invite Matt to come and talk about the equations and what the machine actually did and does. Oh, okay, okay. Um, this is quite, quite a big drop uh, into the world. Um, I, I think one thing I'd just like to get across to you guys is that we're going to talk about things like equations, and we're going to talk about solving the equations, and what th this machine can actually do. But what I kind of want to convey to everybody today, and, and wider than even uh, you guys, is that we are all used to talking about quantities of, uh, of things. Like, we've got one single computer here, we've got three children here, 25, 30 people uh, of you here. 
so we're, we're used to talking about discrete quantities. This machine, and Babbage, sorry, Babbage's machine, was very good at adding up discrete quantities. It was clever at the way it manipulated that adding, but it was just really a very good adding machine. We also all know that multiplication is actually a process of repetitive uh, adding. What this machine does is it doesn't add discrete quantities. It actually uh, ma manipulates rates of change. And that's something that we all talk about. <coughs> if I talk about integration and differentiation, which is words I'm just trying to not, not use those words. Today, I want us to think about rates of change. For instance, um, this is the example we, we discussed earlier, that um, when you're a child, you grow relatively quickly. You get up to adulthood, and then you're not growing any longer. So your rate of change of growth has slowed right down, you become an adult, you carry on, and in fact my nan, when she was about 70, got osteoporosis, and she actually shrunk. So her rate of growth of height was negative. We're all used to the fact that the weeds grow far too quickly in the garden, um, the house prices are always ever increasing, the rates on the stock market are going up as well as down. So we're actually used to talking about rates of change, but we, we kind of don't like to know how those rates of change can be manipulated. But your car, when you look at the speedometer, you see that a car is driving down the street at say 30 miles an hour, you know that if you put your foot down, you can increase your rate of change of distance up to 40 miles per hour. So it's a rate of change. We all are quite familiar with these things, but we don't necessarily know how important they are. And in certain subjects, rates of change are very, very important. If you're in the stock market and you see the prices of your stocks going down, well, if they go down a little bit over a period of time, well, it's going to perhaps come up again. But if suddenly one of your stocks is starting to fall very rapidly, then you're going to want to do something about it. It's also true in science. If you want to know whether if you, uh, say, have a satellite rotating around the Earth, at what point, at what height above the Earth, are we going to have to place that satellite so that it doesn't actually fall back in? It's all about speed, rates of change. We've set up an example on the machine next door which actually manipulates, like Babbage's machine, and it's not digital, it's analog. So Turing and people subsequently had machines that could manipulate numbers. This machine manipulates quantities by uh, measuring the rotation of, of, of axles. So you've got uh, a, a, um, an axle that is, say, rotating in one direction at a certain speed, and you can speed that up and it, it actually represents a larger quantity. If the axle rotates <coughs> in the other direction, then it's actually a lower quantity and it's a negative number. So this can represent positive and negative numbers by the rotation of axles. If we take the example of a car going down the street, and we're actually going to do this next door on the machine. If we want to know how far a car has travelled, as human beings, we got intuitively, we are used to working out, gosh, if I go up the road and I join the A4 and I come down onto the A2 and I come down to Canterbury, it's going to take me about four hours to come down from the far side of London, say. And I know intuitively that it's going to take that amount of time. If you then look at your sat nav, it says, oh, actually, coming to Canterbury from where I came from in Ealing uh, a couple of days ago, it's actually going to take me two hours, 20 minutes. And the sat nav has done a little, rather more than just a, a, a rough estimate. It's actually calculated that if you join Sansa Road, you will go <coughs> so far in a certain amount of time. If you join a bigger road, you can go faster, you will actually be able to go a larger distance in the same amount of time. We've got an example next door where we're going to see a car accelerate from rest, it's going to speed up, it's going to join some traffic, and it's going to get stuck behind that traffic, and it's going to remain going along at a certain speed. We, we happen to have picked, um, it's actually going to travel along at 30 miles an hour, get stuck in the traffic, it's then going to join a bigger road, and it's going to accelerate up to 40 miles an hour. At some point in the distance, we see that there's a set of traffic lights, and I'll put the traffic lights here. The traffic lights are red. So we're going to have to slow down. So at first, I take my foot off the accelerator, and the car's going to start to slow down naturally. But at some point, I'm going to want to have to brake and slow the car down even more. But I think all of us who've been had driving lessons, not everybody will know this, but you are taught by your driving test 
uh, your driving uh, teacher that you need to use what's called progressive braking. You apply the brake gently at first, you press the brake pedal down hard, quite hard, and then just as you're coming to a stop, you actually take your foot off the pedal. So you come to a nice halt. Instead of this. Yeah, so instead of you recoiling and rebounding as you suddenly uh, arrive at the traffic lights, you, all your passengers and all your parcels on the back shelf and your milk and your yogurts are not going to be thrown over everybody. So what this uh, machine does is it actually calculates how far the car has gone, no matter what speed it was doing, no matter how hard it was accelerating, no matter how hard it was stopping or how gently it came up to the traffic lights, it will give you the same result that your sat nav would have done, merely by rotating axles one way or the other way, and depending on how fast or how slow or what direction those axles go. <coughs> now, that's a trivial example. It's, it's actually um, uh, enabling uh, a machine to uh, calculate, uh, as, as Tom's already pointed out, um, a form of integration, which is a mathematical um, uh, requirement in, in an awful lot of, of maths. That system can then be extrapolated to enable you to solve problems in uh, rocketry, in space flight, uh, in economics, uh, in uh, large amounts of physics uh, and sciences where you need to understand what's actually going on in quite complex situations. And one of the examples that we'll give next door is about how the uh, British Navy were able to uh, fire shells from 8 or even 10 miles away and hit the German ships by the first or with the second shell. And the Germans couldn't believe it. How on earth can the, the British be so accurate when they have no <coughs> idea? Because in the old days, up until the point that they started to use this kind of computer, what they had to do was to fire a number of shells. They had a man on the very high point of the battleship, and he would have to see visibly whether the shells were going beyond.